welcome back. Great to have you guys. And if you're new to us, I'm Michael Stamatinos, your host for the Advancing Healthcare Innovation Show. And we're just we're really passionate about healthcare innovation, adoption, and anything to do with the healthcare space. So what we're really doing here is we're highlighting real people that are innovating within this space. And we've got just a jam-packed year. If you've been with us before, welcome back. Uh, or if you're new to us, hit the subscribe button. We'd love to hear what you think about the content. And in this upcoming series theme, we're really focusing on coordinated care. And I'm delighted to have our guest, Laura McKee, who is the co-founder and president of Huku.ai. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. It's really um, always fun to talk with innovative people about what needs to happen in healthcare and our little part and hopefully contributing to it. Absolutely. You know, when we first had our, our initial conversation, I just, it was so delightful uh, to chat with you and hear a little bit about your story and the evolution of how kind of Huku came about. Would you mind maybe just starting off uh, a little bit of that, maybe just at a high level so the folks can kind of learn a little bit more about you and how kind of Huku came about? Sure, absolutely. So my background is pretty straight business. Um, even though I went to a small liberal arts college, I came out with economics and computer science and went into consulting. Uh, took a detour to teach math in the Central African Republic in the Peace Corps. And then when I came back, I entered Kellogg's School of Business and worked for McKinsey for a few years, then, you know, did various businessy things with mostly consumer facing uh, large corporations left my last corporate gig in March of 2009. And I was fortunate enough to be co-founder of Autism Home Support Services, which is an applied behavior analysis therapy group based here in Chicago. We hired some amazing board certified behavior analysts and built a team of clinicians who could focus on the kids that they were serving, the families that they were serving, because we put all the technology and process and people in place to help the team, you know, do what the team needed to do and to grow the business end of things. And uh, we had some reimbursement tailwinds. So we were able to grow to three markets, Chicago, Detroit, and Denver. And then we actually sold to a national private equity backed therapy company. So uh, having had that exit and being bitten by the entrepreneurial bug a little bit, I started to think about what I could take from what I learned at Autism Home Support um, to the aging population. My parents, you know, are of that age. They moved from Northwest Arkansas to here in Chicago uh, to a really great continuing care retirement community, um, which then subsequently recruited me to their board. So I've been pretty immersed in, you know, the being mortal process that Atulka Wande describes in his book and how challenging it is in the American healthcare system. Uh, so I was introduced to Asif Khan, who is a successful entrepreneur with a, a company called Care Merge already under his belt. And when he described his vision for Huku, which is short for Huku Cure, Care Anywhere in Latin, it's really all about putting the patient at the center and providing supportive HIPAA compliant communication. It's Slack meets WhatsApp, optimized for healthcare. And we both, you know, recognize that one of the most significant needs is in post-acute care, where uh, margins are very low, um, staff turnover is a huge issue, and uh, having that ability to have supportive, easy communication, you know, could really make a difference um, for the healthcare professionals as well as for the families um, and the and the folks who are in those settings. So that's you know what we've been working on for the last couple of years, and uh, it's been a great journey so far. And you know I'm excited to tell you more about it. Thank you for sharing that. I mean it's it's amazing to what personalized this for me was let's just say you have a caretaker or a clinician who's very involved in a family member's point of care, and then they end up leaving, going to a different organization. That's happened before. It's going to continue to happen. But that that intellectual know how of what's going on with the case is really not a good way of being able to translate that. Obviously you've got things that are going on within the patient records and such. I mean, what was it? Was it a particular instance that really led you to think about like why Huku really needs to exist? Um, what was the sort of that straw that broke the camel's back to say, you know what, we need to make this thing happen. 
Yeah, I mean, I think Asif's personal story, you know, was really what animated him from the beginning. His parents were going through some healthcare challenges. And even though they, they live in Pakistan, he was, you know, helping them to, you know, figure out how to coordinate care and how to um, get all of the doctors who were working with his mom on the same page. And they just didn't have any solution at all. Um, and when his dad said, well, you, you know, you work at GE Healthcare at the time, right? One of the most sophisticated, you know, healthcare companies in the U.S. How would they do it in the U.S.? And Asif's response was, well, not very well, quite frankly. So, um, you know, EHRs have, you know, made significant inroads over the last few years. But we joke that EHR stands for everyone hates it, really, because they've been <laughs> built for billing they haven't really been built for care. And, you know, the sophisticated huge hospital systems may be reasonably happy with their particular Epic instance and be able to communicate with other, you know, sophisticated hospital systems that have Epic, but there are dozens of, you know, well-penetrated EHRs in post-acute care and home health and, you know, other settings that just don't, you know, communicate. And even with the current interoperability, it's not easy. Right. So what we enable is really easy communication, both within the organization and across organizations so that, you know, when a patient leaves, you know, say the Mayo Clinic, you know, we were uh, just in the Mayo Clinic, Arizona State MedTech Accelerator. In those settings, you know, there's great care coordination within Mayo. Then they leave and they go to rehab or they go to, you know, their home and there's just no visibility on, you know, how the patient is progressing, um, how to avoid any potential complications. And now there's real incentives, you know, financial incentives, uh, along with, you know, just the quality of care incentives to assure that those patients continue to progress and don't wind up back in the hospital. What have you found to be sort of a tailwind over the course of the last 12 months. We've had a very interesting last 12 months. The world has changed slightly. What has been helpful for you in getting access and in, in, in getting things to move forward? Yeah, obviously the pandemic has had, you know, both positive and negative consequences to everyone. Um, there's been, you know, more pandemic silver linings, I think, you know, than, than people, would have predicted, um, in particular, uh, virtual visits and the um, acceptance of telehealth, you know, has really advanced significantly. And that's been for us a, a huge opportunity because we um, have one touch telehealth integrated in Huku with Zoom. And Zoom is, you know, a solution that uses the least bandwidth of any potential solution. Um, and it enables our nurse practitioner customers um, to work with their customers um, and have, you know, very easy access to the patients um, to, to address, you know, needs as they come up. So, you know, telehealth, the acceptance of telehealth, the ability of, you know, making progress with patients in that way, I think has, has actually improved some, you know, relationships and some access to care. Obviously, working in so many skilled nursing locations, you know, with the number of shutdowns that have taken place, you know, that, that has been difficult because we are the type of people who build relationships face-to-face -face. and, you know, Zoom helps, but it's not the same, you know, as sitting in a room with people and being able to walk down the hallway and really see, you know, what's going on. So we're excited about things opening up again and the opportunity, you know, to really um, get in the trenches with our customers more. Well, how have you, how have you innovated throughout this, this time period? And how do you define so, innovation? Is there, yeah, is your, so is your a, definition you know, of innovation evolved? 100%. Um, we're a lean startup um, with an agile methodology, right? So what that means is we're so lucky to have really creative, innovative customers who were looking for a better way of doing the things that they do every day. And so we listen to them and we work with them to add features and functions that will make their lives easier. And, and that's, you know, how we innovate. So we launched our very first version, you know, early last year, and it was just communication. And then we launched patient center communication, and then we launched collaborators um, communicating within the patient channels. 
And like I said, we added one touch telehealth. We added the patient family channel so that professionals can have their collaborative interactive conversations and, you know, include documents and um, photos and all the things they need to include and then switch over to the family channel, um, which, you know, so home health organizations and home care organizations that we're working with have found super helpful, especially during the pandemic to keep families on the same page, you know, with, and share status updates of how their family member is doing. So those are some of the, you know, more important innovations that we um, were able to come up with. We also uh, have a customer who's an area agency on aging, and they've been tremendously uh, interactive with us in developing social determinants of health tracking and mm -hmm. enabling them to have real-time acuity ratings based on, you know, the assessments that they want to use, but didn't have easy access to or easy way of, of tracking for their patients. So we're continuing to innovate with them in ways that, you know, will make them more relevant and more powerful to their customers. Um, so our, our biggest challenge is not, you know, um, how to innovate, it's how to choose which innovate innovations you know, to really focus on that are, that are going to have the biggest impact. Uh, and, and that comes from our process of working with our, our strategic customers. So how do you how do you measure which features you want to move first? Is there a, a certain methodology that you guys use from a prioritization point of view? What's been that? You that, know, that's that a really good question, because um, at the end of the day, it's really what the customer's you know, needs are and how they're driving it. But they don't always know, you know, what it is that, you know, is, is going to be the most helpful. I mean, nobody thought that we needed a computer in our pocket, you know, until uh, Apple and Steve Jobs envisioned how this could change our lives. And um, I think it does take, you know, a charismatic or visionary leadership to be able to listen to your gut on where to take the innovation. And we're really lucky because Asif is that kind of um, visionary and he is very involved in you know, all aspects of the business and, and in leading our, our engineering team. And we've got this amazing engineering team who you know, we put a challenge out there and they work with the designers to come up with the best way you know, to implement it. And we just you know, keep doing that, you know, plan, try, you know, evaluate loop until we can, you know, assure that we're having impact. You know, you mentioned earlier about having partners that you can innovate with and having that access with people that are early adopters. Healthcare is notorious for not having too many early adopters. And yet you guys have found a way of um, broadening that reach. What's What's, why have, why have you guys been so successful in that at such an early stage? It's, it's awesome. That's a, it, you know, as I think about that, it, I think it has to do with, um, our openness, um, both Asif and I really believe in collaboration and in the network and that you don't know, you know, where the network will take you. Um, if you're always looking for ways to have a positive impact, um, and you ask good questions, opportunities will reveal themselves. And um, I always like to say, you make your own luck, right? Because when you see an opportunity and you act on it, that's what people call luck, right? Um, so um, we, I think we're really lucky that we met some people who were really interested in improving the efficiency and effectiveness of what they're doing and you know, are willing to invest the time you know, that it takes to do that. Um, so um, I would say listening is the most important superpower because when you hear what people's interests are and what their needs are, you can connect with that and find ways of you know, just creating value, I guess, is the way I would put it. Yeah, there's something about having that openness and you've, you mentioned it about there's a, there's a difference between you know, spotting an opportunity and, and creating an opportunity. And you don't actually know truly, your customers might not necessarily know exactly what it is that they really, really want. And there's that bit of intuition, visioning that allows you to be creative. And that, I think there's an aspect of innovation that 
revolves around a lot of creativity and and it's and, it's really and, getting, and, it's and, it, and it really works better in teamwork right because yeah. you know all of us have our own perspectives that we bring to a problem and um none of us all you know should know the answer going into a discussion about you know what the best solution is you might have a pretty good idea of a you know yep. pretty good solution but i've never been in a conversation where a team member couldn't bring more to that solution um, and challenge the way it's being done um, so that you come out of it you know with with a better answer and then the most important thing is just to act right like we could talk about what the right answer is all day long but at some point you just have to say, well, let's try this yeah. and, you know, see how that goes. And, you know, maybe it's a smashing success and you keep doing more of that and maybe it's not. And you say, huh, I wonder what we should do differently next time. And that's, you know, what agile development is really all about, right? Is I bet this would be useful. And, you know, then you see how far you can take that. Um, so yeah, some, they, of, some, some of our I, customers I are doing things that we never thought they would do. Yeah, that's the beauty of it, right? Is going into it with that openness and you get surprised and you're like, oh, wow, that's pretty interesting. And you dive in further. Now, there's a lot of talk around successes and little wins around innovation. And you've noted some. And there's this other aspect which isn't really talked about. Um, you know, the dips, the, the setbacks, the failures. What, what have you found, even within the last few months, things that maybe haven't panned out? How have you you know, can you maybe share something that with the with with the audience about maybe some setbacks you guys have gone through in the last several months? Yeah, what um, you've learned. I think of the most relevant one. You know, with any so, uh, technology solution, the real question is always, will they use it? You know, one <laughs> of the venture people I know says, will the dogs eat the dog food? You know, you made dog food, but you only know if it's good if the dogs eat the dog food. Um, and that's always a question, you know, with especially a communication solution, because it really works if everybody is using it, but you have to kind of get that critical mass. And we have definitely had some customers who, like the top leadership, were, were you know, very committed to using Huku. And yet it was really hard to get, you know, adoption. So, you know, that, that the way. say again, what got in the way? human behavior right is um is shapeable it does change over time but it, there's a lot of inertia that is you know often reinforced you know by your culture and your environment i i learned this you know to the nines from the board certified behavior analyst that i worked with and so um creating that behavioral momentum where people you know have enough of a you know reward experience are reinforced enough that they continue to, you know, move in that direction um, re requires, first off, that the that the solution, that the app itself, just works really well for what it is that they want to do, and that the environment is also, you know, supportive and and conducive to them, you know, using the app. Um, so we're, you know, just working really hard to make sure that the app is super fast. We, you know, rolled out the web version after the mobile version because lots of people want to be able to communicate, you know, from their laptop, from their desktop. Um, so making it as flexible as possible, continually improving the performance and the speed of the app because, you know, people's patience is limited, um, you, know, ha you know, has really helped. And, um, you know, we just have to keep trying new and different things. And sometimes it's a matter of just, you know, the, the, the opportunity catching up with the people and, and the incentives being in place. So yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a process. It's an ongoing process. Yeah, how have the incentives aligned for Hugu to reinforce the behavior of them actually utilizing the application? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that and how that's changed? Yeah, so um, for sure, the direction of policy on um, federal reimbursement is heading towards a need for much more collaboration and value-based care depends on it, right? Like actual care that's patient-centered requires people to coordinate and communicate. 
And with CMS now putting real financial incentives in place, and with the trends towards more and more Medicare Advantage plans, you know, some metro markets are more than 50% Medicare Advantage plans. Those plans have much more financial incentive to coordinate and require all of their referral partners and um, network members to coordinate. So those, those forces, we believe, are going to push people. Um, the other forces is millennials. You know, they, they would rather, you know, have their arm cut off than put down their phone. And those, you know, changes are going to come about as, you know, the workforce shifts where people are just more comfortable and digital, you know, digitally interacting. Uh, and, and it just makes their lives easier to have an app that they can access that easily. Um, so, so those are a couple of the, you know, I think big forces that are driving innovation in healthcare. And you, know, you mentioned about having things being patient-centered. Can you walk us through an instance of who's involved if we have multiple stakeholders involved with HUKU? Can you maybe just take us through like a real live use case? Sure. Folks that are interacting, like share about a little bit about Yeah, that. sure. So, um, so let's look at a typical, you know, baby boomer with a hip replacement, you know, surgery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those were slowed down during the pandemic, but it's all coming yeah. back, right? So they have their primary care physician who refers them to their orthopedic specialist who, um, you know, schedules their surgery. They have the team at the hospital who are responsible, you know, for that um, acute care incident. And as hospitals um, have been discharging people as quickly as they can, the, the discharge process you know, needs to be managed with typically, uh, you know, a, a discharge nurse handling the communication process. And in most cases, that individual will then be transitioned to a rehab facility, right? right? So with HUKU, all of those folks, the primary care physician, the orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon's office staff, the discharge nurse, the um, admission specialist at the skilled nursing facility, the physical therapist who's working with the individual, the nursing team at the um, skilled nursing facility, all those folks can you know, communicate and um, identify you know, when potential complications might arise, communicate about the status of the patient, and um, most importantly for the family, you know, manage those transitions. Because I, I, I know what it, what it was like for me being in a hospital with a family member and, you know, when, is, when are they going to discharge? It's, you know, <laughs> sometime between the next 20 minutes and the next three days. And then usually you find out, you know, it's now, you know. So to be able to communicate and coordinate those processes just reduces the amount of wasted time and effort and and frankly, frustration and stress, which uh, is, you know, a, a huge issue in healthcare. Burnout is, you know, the thing that we all should be focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how do, how do folks learn more about HUKU and how can we follow you and track progress and celebrate little wins with you? Well, we would love to have more people engaging um, in the conversation about how to improve patient-centered care. And uh, we um, are on huku.ai is our website. We're on all the social media. So follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn um, and Twitter. And we also you know, are participating in different conferences. So um, the American Medical Directors Association actually awarded us in their Shark Tank uh, award from their innovation uh, team. And um, we participated in the Colorado AMDA conference. We're gonna be participating in the N4A conference, which is an association for area agencies on aging um, because our uh, area agency on aging customer believes that what we're doing really changes you know, the way that AAAs can inter integrate with their community and collaborate and coordinate. They're all moving more into um, care coordination with big payers. So they need better tools for that. So, um, so those are some of the places, and and quite frankly, like I said, we're we're always open to ideas. So if if um, if you have uh, you know an opportunity for us to help improve healthcare, we're we're interested in talking. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely link that down in the description, and um, you know, just we've got a wide range audience. We've got 
just innovators in general, enthusiasts. We also have, you know, doers, people that are really uh, building things. So I think there's always synergies there. In addition to that, also on the payer provider side, there's innovation happening there. And we've got, um, you know, kind of touch all those aspects. So it's been, it's been awesome, Laura, to just sort of hear and see the evolution of Huku and just even a few months, how things have changed dramatically. And it's been, uh, it's been delightful. So for those of you in the audience, you know, make sure if you, if you're, wherever you're consuming this, you know, would you, would you mind sharing it on social media? Would you mind commenting it? And any, any folks that we can bring into this network to advance healthcare forward is, it's always a good thing. And, you know, so until next time, see you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Michael. It's my pleasure.